I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Manish Sagar to come up to the podium. Manish is a computational neuroscientist who, in our department, and uh, his work relates to learning and creativity. And uh, there you go. Oh, good. Yeah. And um, and is one of my great privileges to see someone with exciting interdisciplinary expertise that brings his work to our field. Thank you. So thanks so much for having me. And it's eight more minutes, and then you're done. I'm the last one, I guess. Uh, so just no, there's one more. Never mind. You're not done. Uh, so this cartoon here kind of sort of represents everything it's gonna, I'm going to talk about. And please take time reading it, and maybe laugh because I spent ten dollars buying the license for it. Uh, Today I'll talk about how computational neuropsychiatry could help us, perhaps, uh, with some of the questions that were raised throughout the day with diagnosis, di diagnosing different psychiatric disorders. And I don't really need to talk about prevalence because we already have talked so much about how prevalent mental health issues are and we really need to do something uh, about them. But I will talk about um, a comparison of, let's say, a mental health disorder with any other medical condition really quickly. So let's say we take type 2 diabetes uh, as an example, uh, and both have pretty complex etiology and pathophysiology. However, uh, one of them has a biological marker, which is measuring glucose or A1C in your blood, and that gives us a beautiful, uh, or not beautiful, but very precise uh, tracking the disorder, testing different treatments, and so on and so forth, which is not the case in case of mental health disorders. When I'm talking about clinical space, of course, in research, we try to develop new biomarkers all the time. But if you go to a clinician's office in a psychiatric clinic anywhere, most likely you will be diagnosed by some cluster of behaviors. So how can we change that? Well, of course, we're dealing with the brain here, so we need to observe the brain. And many people have talked about already about neuroimaging. There are several ways to image the brain, magnetic, uh, electric, optic, and some cool I forgot the name of the company, Open Waters or something, some cool ways of measuring the brain as well. And many people have done that. We have, in psychology or neuroscience, people have looked at, well, what happens if you enhance creativity in somebody in the brain? What happens if they meditate a lot? Or what happens with brain development and so on and so forth? But almost all of these studies were done at the group level, looking at 50, 60, 100 people at one time and on average talking something about it. And as Amit mentioned, and I stole his, uh, slide over there. The lack of, there are new papers coming out which talk about how it's very hard to go from group studies to individual uh, information. And it's, if you imagine, if you go to a clinician and he has just read a study about uh, some disorder A versus healthy controls on average, they say, oh, blah, blah, network gets affected, then how in the world can he apply it to you as a person? And that's where the idea that also Amit mentioned is, is, is it possible to do neuroimaging in n equal to one? Just one person, can we, can we extract reliable insights out of that and then use it? And to do that, you need to make sure that whatever insights you come up with are robust against some kind of noise, are reliable, and of course, are sensitive enough to pick up the state changes you're looking for. But I'll push one more step and say, in addition to being reliable and everything else, it also, we also, most neuroimaging technologies uh, tell you what's happening but they, they may or may not give you the insight about why is it happening or how is it happening. So they're descriptive at, uh, at most, in most cases, and not giving you the insight about the mechanisms behind it. So talking about n equal to one neuroimaging, um, and then, um, so that's this, so people is just one dimension there. So you can look at group studies or individual participants or within session. But the other issue with neuroimaging at large is we not only average across people, we also average data across space and time. We look at the entire brain or we average across regions or we average across uh, 10, 20, 50 minutes worth of scan time sometimes. So imagine somebody with, let's say, ADHD who has a um, very naive view of taking ADHD and depression. Somebody with ADHD has very dynamic brain states, they're jumping from one thing to the next, versus somebody with depression, they may get stuck or ruminate about one thing. If we average information in, in uh, brain activity over time, we could miss the entire spectrum where we could use that information to classify these two group of people. So even though most of the neuroimaging studies live here, where we average across people, average across space and time, uh, my pitch is why not go all the way down and actually use computational uh, methods coming from computer science background and let the data decide where it wants to go rather be pushing it in any one way. And so to try that, uh, we use one of the uh, relatively very new um, 
uh, applied mathematics application known as topological data analysis, where you try to learn the shape of the data. So with this very crude, very simple example, there are a bunch of dots sampled from a circle. And if you ask a human, they're like, oh, it looks like you're sampling from a circle. But it's very hard for a machine to tell that. But TDA can let you do that. It can tell you that it looks like there is some kind of filtered simplicial complex, meaning there is some kind of loop there, and we can pick it up. This is only two-dimensional data, but imagine the same thing being applied to 300,000 dimensions. And how can then we learn the shape of the data? So that's what we applied to neuroimaging data very recently. And in a task where participants uh, did multiple things, so for three minutes they had mind wandering, for then another three minutes they did memory task, and so on and so forth. And we wanted to see how, if we, without averaging data in space, time, or across people at n equal to one level, can we capture any insights about brain activations over time? And so if you're familiar with manifold learning, we're essentially trying to capture the underlying state of the brain dynamics without averaging in any way. So here is data from one person, about 1,000 time points. Uh, and each, each three-dimensional brain has like 300,000 features. So this is the shape graph that pops up. Similar graph as I showed before with just circles, where each point now is the entire brain. So if the brain activity at any one time point is very similar to activity at other time points, they would kind of merge together or be linked in this graph. And we can color them because we can color code which tasks they're doing, and that shows up in a nice way like this, where, as you can see, rather than averaging data in, in three-minute chunks or two-minute chunks, the data automatically nicely clusters into these tightly knit uh, piece in the center, and then these excursions around the, the brain state. And I'll, I'll show you a cool movie which really explains how useful this information could be. Things get very interesting when you take the same shape graphs from two different people. Now, I don't know if I have time to quiz you guys. We have one minute and 22 seconds left. But the, one, of, one of these shape graphs are somebody who was a very bad performer. I mean, he was barely probably even uh, doing 70% accurate level or accuracy level. And the other person was 98% accuracy level. And some other time I'll quiz you, but the, on the right was the best performer. And the idea, if you look closely in these, these shape graphs, the person on the right has these red dots which prefer connecting to the red dots, whereas the person on the left has more of a pie chart thing where irrespective of which task they're doing, their brain activation map is very similar. But the other person is very efficient and they use very specific tasks, specific networks to do each task. So now imagine something like this in a patient population. These are healthy controls doing healthy, ta I mean simple tasks. But imagine something like that we can extract from somebody with ADHD and depression. And then as a clinician, you know, it's a crazy vision I have, but the clinician could have a plot like this in front of them and then see how a treatment things are changing, how the underlying shape of the brain dynamics is changing over time with different treatments. And then we can do cool stuff with it, again, in the sense that most, as I mentioned, we are not averaging data over time. So animation is only for coolness purpose, doesn't serve any other purpose. But then if you play the movie, you can see over time, we could track the, the activation changes in the brain at statistical level, meaning significant, not significant level, uh, at, the second, at the level of every single TR, meaning every single acquisition rate, which has never been done before. So we can really see what's happening in the brain at a very fine temporal scale. Now, I promise you, we can, I want to go beyond neuroimaging in a sense to take from descriptive statistical values to the mechanistic aspect to precisely ask the question, well, what can we do to make the worst performer the best performer? Should we go to Amit and get a zapper and zap somebody at XYZ location? Should we go to maybe Caroline, get a pill, and then change the behavior in some way? And to do something like that, we can, one idea I had is to create a computational model, a computational framework where you can um, simulate, I think somebody from DARPA, I forgot his name, who's talk, just talked about it, how we, it's, there's a need to simulate the entire brain activity and the entire brain network as close to reality as possible. And we could do that where these brain circuits could, you could say, oh, region X, Y, Z, I need to change the inhibition excitation balance and then see what kind of brain activity pops up. Or if somebody in a TMS clinic goes and say, the clinician says they need to enhance frontal activity, then we can run a simulation with 100 different uh, modulation parameters, a million different modulation parameters to come up with the most optimized one for that person. So stuff like that is coming shortly. And so to summarize, uh, yes, we have a complex uh, uh, etiology and pathophysiology. Yes, the diagnosis right now is very, very um, based basically on, mostly on the behavior, but using n equal to one year imaging, no averaging data unnecessarily, and then doing large-scale computational modeling might give us the answer. Thank you.